Hello once again, this is Daniel from Ghana sharing with you some thoughts from the Word of God to help you in your own study of God's Word. Last time I brought a message to you, it was about the Word of God and we talked about four aspects of the Word of God uh, which are important for all of us to understand, appreciate if we are to respond properly. We also talked about several ways that we respond to the Word of God, including reading, memorizing, meditating, obeying, uh, and so forth. Now, from following up from that, I want to talk today about studying to show ourselves approved. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15 says that we should study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Those are Paul's words to Timothy. As a young servant of the Lord, it was important that he handle the word of God properly. So we'd like to discuss this today and break it down a little bit and show how we can be more diligent and careful in our own handling of the word of God so that we can be a help and a blessing to others as well as uh, grow strong in the Lord. So the first thing I want to point out from this is the need to be serious. When we handle the Word of God, it's important that we take it as something very important to us. There are a lot of things that we might take seriously in life. For instance, I made mention last time that if the doctor had told you you had stage 3 melanoma, that would be pretty important information for you to deal with. The Bible is, there's nothing more important than the information provided us in the Bible. The consequence of uh, our response to that could lend us or lead us into eternal torment in the place of the lake of fire, or it could lead us into eternal happiness and joy with our Lord Jesus in heaven. Uh, it can also equip us and provide us uh, a rich spiritual life if we obey its precepts, or we could run into all kinds of hardships and difficulties and losses because we do not give heed to God's instruction book. So let's make sure that we have a passionate interest in the Word of God, looking at it um, with some excitement and passion and great interest. Um, you know, it should not be a painful process to spend uh, a whole day reading our Bible and thinking about its truth. If we know how important this book is, then I think we will be very serious in our study and consideration of it. Now, a lot of us maybe spend a few minutes a day doing devotions. We read our Bible, think about it, and then we pass on to the rest of our day and don't maybe give as much time and attention to the Word of God as we ought to. If we're going to be approved unto God, a <coughs> workman, uh, for God, then <clears throat> it's necessary for us to take the Word of God very seriously and to apply ourselves. So I just want to encourage us to think uh, about being serious with the Word of God. Very serious. Some people go to university <clears throat> and study for years to get a uh, degree um, in some discipline so that they can work for many years in that uh, particular area. Uh, yet, do we think of the Bible that way, or do we relegate the study of God's Word to those who we think are called specially to ministry? Uh, every Christian should study the Word of God. We should all take it very seriously. God wants us all to know His Word, and He expects, uh, expects us to take some time and interest. So, some of the greatest joy, I think, in my life is when I can spend some real quality time spend a whole day just meditating, thinking, working through study notes, and trying to prepare some food for God's people. It's a tremendous joy. Also, if we're going to study the Word of God, it's important for us to find some good Bible helps. Today we're very fortunate to have a lot of Bible helps available to us in past centuries men who want to study the Bible <clears throat> had to invest a large amount into various um, books so that they could study, you know, and they had to do a lot of um, 
research and uh, study of ancient languages. But today we're, we're very blessed because people have done a great deal of work on our behalf to create dictionaries and commentaries and all kinds of uh, uh, word, uh, studies for the original languages, Greek and Hebrew. And all of this is readily available at our fingertips. We can download a program like eSword or Online Bible. There's a host of Bible software. A lot of it's free. Some of it's very, you know, not very costly. You can invest thousands of dollars if you want, if you have the money, and buy some very, very expensive software. But uh, that's not really necessary for something simple and free like eSword. It gives you uh, many, many English translations as well as other translations and other languages and uh, helps in the original languages, dictionaries, commentaries, so many things that help us. These things are invaluable if we're going to dig into the Word of God and learn it well. We're at such an advantage and there's really no excuse for anybody today not to um, make these things available to themselves to learn the Word of God. When I first became a believer, I didn't even know what a Bible commentary or dictionary was. I had a Bible, I read it, and I enjoyed learning. But when I learned that there was other resources available uh, from godly men who have studied the Word of God over their lives and have prepared excellent tools and, and notes to benefit us all, I really took advantage of that, and I have ever since tried to read as much as I can. Today we have the advantage of being able to Google search just about anything we want and there is benefits to that because we can, maybe we're studying something like Calvinism and we want to look it up and understand what that's all about. We run the danger of not only finding a lot of information out there but that we would find the bad with the good. And I've seen believers who, you know, they, they read so much material it's easy to get sidetracked easy to get off on the wrong tangent. So we have to be very careful and discerning about the resources that are available to us and how to use them. The best we can do is to read our Bible. Read our Bible over and over and over and just continue to study and read it on our own, asking the Holy Spirit to enlighten and teach us. Um, not to be too dependent on commentaries and uh, sermons and other things we find available. But those things are helpful. We have to recognize that God has called some people to teach and to provide these tools for us and we do well to take advantage but it is only through our own careful study of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit teaching us that we will be equipped to discern truth from error and to recognize when somebody is teaching us something false or um, you know, not handling the Word of God correctly. So just a warning there. There's so much available and it's easily to get sidetracked. We have one brother here and uh, he got off track on some very major doctrines because he was reading a whole lot of stuff and I was quite surprised at him um, going in that direction. But we all run the danger if we listen to the voice of men rather than to the voice of the Spirit of God teaching us through his word. So look for Bible helps. That's a very important thing if we're going to study the Word of God and to be useful for God. There's so much available and we can make use of all of that. I use online uh, tools, um, as I say, eSword and others become a staple for me to study the Word of God. And I have lots of books on my shelf, but a lot of them can collect dust because I have far more available to me through the internet and through these various study tools online. Now, also, if we're going to study God's Word, we need to be prayerful. Reading the Bible and studying the Bible is a spiritual exercise. It's not as though we are trying to prepare for a math exam at school. That's different. That's academic. But the Bible is more than academic. It's spiritual, and it's spiritual food. And so, if we're to learn from God, we need to be in contact with God through prayer. We need to ask His help and grace to reveal the truths of Scripture to us. It's good and wise when we are studying our Bibles to say, Lord, show me, teach me, help me to understand your word and to be careful in how I handle it so I can be accurate and convey its truth to others accurately. The mishandling of the word of God is a very great travesty and the Lord takes it very seriously when people presume to know his word and share it, but they do so 
at their own peril if they make grievous errors and lead people to the wrong understanding of Scripture. All of us are limited, and I know the Lord will show us grace because of our ignorance and our inability to understand all the things in His Word. But I think the Lord expects us to be very careful in our handling of the Word, to handle it humbly, respectfully, and to use the best uh, available tools at our disposal to help us understand. And the best we can do is pray. When we pray and we depend on God for His teaching, He'll be gracious to answer our prayers and to help us gain understanding of His Word. None of us has any special qualifications. Uh, it's only by His grace that He gives us an ability to discern and learn the spiritual truths He set forth in His Word. So I encourage us to consider if we're going to be serious and study carefully that we pray. We constantly shower our study with prayer so that we can hear His voice. Also, another important thing that you want to do to learn the Word of God and study it is to find an area or an opportunity to minister the Word of God to others. There's nothing that motivates us more than to have an opportunity to share the Word of God with others. If you're evangelistic and you are, we should all be evangelistic, but if you happen to be really bent in that direction, uh, you need a place to share the gospel with others as you equip yourself with the Word of God and you have a ministry in evangelism. It gives you all the more motivation to prepare yourself, study those gospel accounts and the message through Romans or what have you to prepare well to answer objections and to speak clearly about the Word of God and His teaching. It, uh, it's a shame to us if we can't handle the Word of God well and we're trying to communicate to others its truths. Uh, so, look for opportunities uh, according to your ability, according to the level the Lord has given you to take opportunity. And even as young believers, we can find places and opportunity to share the Word of God with others. As a brand new Christian, that I was in the church and I heard an announcement that they needed a Sunday school teacher for some boys that had been coming to church. And I thought, well, I'd like to do that. I was a brand new Christian and I volunteered and I was surprised they gave me a go ahead to, to do it. But it was a tremendous opportunity for me and it really pushed me to study, to learn the Word of God. I remember going through the Gospel of John with these boys and it was a delight to me. I learned far more than the boys ever did, but in the process, I'm sure they got some blessing, and I certainly was blessed because I was learning the Word of God with the view of sharing it with others. I, I often thought as a young believer, what would ever qualify me to teach other people? Most of the people in a church I went to were older folks. They've been Christians for many years. What could I possibly share with them they don't already know? But there's a tremendous sense of joy. The first time I got up and shared a sermon in, in my home assembly as a fairly young believer, I was so nervous and so uncertain about it, but about 15 seconds after opening my mouth and speaking, I was flooded with this joy, tremendous joy that I was doing this for the Lord and speaking on His behalf. So there's a tremendous joy and motivation that comes from using the Word of God in serving the needs of others. If we value the Word of God and we value our relationship to Christ, then in sharing the Word of God, we find joy, we find purpose, we find motivation. So look for opportunities where you can share the Word of God, whether privately or publicly in the church or in other ministries in some way. As the Lord opens doors of opportunity for you, then you'll be highly motivated to prepare yourself. And it is important that whatever we do, we do it heartily as unto the Lord. We shouldn't be lazy in our study. We should be very diligent to ourselves and then God is pleased to use us where we're at according to our ability and in the context of the ministry in which we find ourselves. We have to know what we're qualified to do and what we're not qualified to do. I'm no scholar. I couldn't speak at some scholarly level, but I, I can teach the Bible at some level for some people to appreciate and enjoy and, and find blessing. Another important thing that we want to do when we read our Bibles and study them is to be inquisitive. To be inquisitive, 
We need to ask questions as we read the Bible. This is the great way we learn, is when we ask questions of the text. We look at the text carefully and we say, what does that mean? Why did he say that? Why is this word used and not that word? Or why did he change from here to there? And, uh, we've got to have, as, as William MacDonald used to say, when you read your Bible, you need a question mark for a brain. You just constantly bombard the text with questions. This is how the Lord speaks to us. This is how the Lord teaches us. It's through our, uh, our queries, through our questions. What do you mean by this, Lord? I don't get this. And as we come humbly as, as hungry children and we, we take God's word seriously, we really want to know, we're passionate to know what it means, that's when he begins to feed us and, and show us the treasures that are hidden there in the word of God for all of us. Another thing I want to encourage you to do if you're going to study the Bible is to take notes and keep notes. Be organized about it. Many years ago, uh, a teacher, not William MacDonald, but Jim McCarthy, who was teaching myself and others, suggested that uh, an organized way of keeping notes for Bible study was important for future ministry. I took that to heart way back then, and I've been doing it ever since. So I have developed, um, used to be physically, now it's electronically, files for every book of the Bible. And I keep notes in there, I keep sermons in, in those files. I also have amassed a great number of articles and uh, books and, and writings and different things that I've studied and learned and I put them all in some kind of organized fashion in a directory in my computer. So I have amassed thousands and thousands of notes, pages of notes for study. Now how does that help me? Well it helps me a great deal because if I've, I've done studies on every chapter of the New Testament for radio ministry I did over five years. I can go to any chapter now and find that I've done some study and some notes, uh, some overviews, some maybe outlines, and I can utilize those. If somebody asks me to speak on a particular subject or a particular place in Scripture, I can usually find some notes that I, I prepared on that, and that helps me tremendously. Why repeat yourself? Our brain can only hold so much information, but when we are careful to write notes and keep things organized, then it becomes a great library a reference tool for us in the future. Um, we've spent five years studying the book of Hebrews and went, uh, wrote a lot of notes on Hebrews and, you know, given our minds we tend to forget things, but if I go back and review my notes, it'll become fresh to me and I'll be able to help others who uh, whom I can maybe help understand the book of Hebrews. We're also working through the Old Testament, doing survey of each book of the Old Testament. As I do that, I collect PowerPoint slides and I make presentations for preaching and teaching <coughs> through the Old Testament. So this is a tremendous tool as well because those can be utilized <coughs> in more ministry in the future as well. So keep good notes. Try to, if you're going to study the Bible, uh, think carefully about how to organize your notes. If you have a laptop, a computer, and you're handy with uh, Microsoft Word or something like that. You can write notes and keep notes and store them and that will be serve you very well in the future. Uh, certainly has been a blessing and a help to me. Another important aspect of studying the Word of God is that we have to learn a little bit about biblical interpretation or what the fancy word is hermeneutics. Hermeneutics, that is the art and science of interpreting scripture. Um, you know, in my journey of spiritual growth, I didn't know hermeneutics very well at all, but I've had to learn some things about interpreting the Bible. And um, as I say, I'm not a scholar, but I've learned some basic principles of interpretation that helped me a great deal. We want to be able to handle God's Word correctly. Where most people go wrong is they, they, they mishandle the Word of God. They, they fail to understand interpretive principles, which we need to be governed by if we're not to make errors. So for instance, some basic ideas might be understanding the distinctions between the Old and New Covenant. That's a very basic idea of understanding the Bible, but surprisingly many people mix up their doctrine, failing to recognize this simple distinction in Scripture between the Old Covenant God made with the Jewish people and the New Covenant God has made with the Church. So that's one area. Another area might be 
um, a distinction between um, types of literature like uh, historical narrative or poetic literature or prophetic literature. These are all different types of literature and need to be handled in, in the way they were intended. Poetic literature tends to be very figurative and it's full of figures of speech, so you have to learn about how figures of speech are used and not to be literal when something's meant to be figurative. When it speaks about the hand of God, it's not a literal phrase, it's, it's a figure of speech to help us understand something. Uh, so it's important that we uh, learn some tools, some tools, some basic principle of hermeneutics to handle the Word of God correctly. This is extremely important in handling the Word of God and not everybody is going to be called to be a Bible teacher and make much use of uh, all these different hermeneutic principles, but we should be aware of them and we should be careful whenever we're seeking to study the Word of God to put into place uh, proper uh, basic principles of interpretation. For instance, every good teacher of the Bible will say context, context, context. Everything has to do with context. When you want to understand what the author is writing about, you need to understand the historical context, um, the uh, theological context in which something is written. It's very important to get an overall grasp of the characters, the history, the grammar, and the phrases that are used in the original languages to properly interpret what's being said. What, what happens with some people is they pick a few words and they add their own understanding and meaning. And of course, words, if you isolate them from their context, can mean a variety of things, but not what the author really intended everything must be fit into its proper context and then we can interpret properly. There may be various ways to apply a text but there's always one interpretation that the Lord is leading us to when he had that written and penned and he may apply it differently in your experience and my experience but nonetheless we should all come to a same understanding of what the Bible uh, is teaching at that particular place. So learn something about hermeneutics and look at some basic principles uh, about that. Uh, the last thing I want to say about studying to show yourself approved is that don't expect to learn everything right away. It's a long journey to study the Bible and we nobody likes somebody who's like an expert, know it at all, always has an answer. None of us really knows everything. We are all on a journey of learning as we go along. And so recognize where you're at in your own study of the Word of God and realize it's a journey forward. God expects us to continue growing, continue learning, and no matter how much time you spend in the Word of God, who can claim to be a master, a teacher? Remember Nicodemus was a master, a teacher of Israel. And the Lord Jesus said to him, you must be born again. And he says, well, how is that possible? And he says, you're a teacher of Israel, you don't know these things. So he was kind of challenging him on what he thought was his credentials, that he was a teacher, that he was somebody. Uh, anybody who handles the Word of God has to recognize with some humility that they really don't know very much at all. We all have a long ways to go. And so in the context in which we find ourselves, God may use you to teach somebody else who maybe is not quite as far as you are. And as long as we know our place and we're humble in our ministry and we're constantly learning and growing ourselves, God can use us as an agent to help others. So uh, there's no shortcut to studying the Word of God. It's a long process. It takes a lot of work, a lot of time, but uh, there are benefits when we are willing to go the long haul, when we're willing to really invest into the Word of God. You know, I was looking recently on the voices for Christ website. If you ever look at that website, you'll find lots of sermons available from a lot of preachers that have long gone from us or some are still living. But a whole host of stuff. And, and, and Jabe Nicholson, some of you know Jabe Nicholson, you'll find over a thousand, oh, it's almost a thousand, it's nearly a thousand messages by Jabe Nicholson. Now you look at that and say, how long would it take you to prepare a thousand messages? Well, it probably took him a lot 
more years prepare himself to be able to have those messages to prepare for others. So it was a colossal amount of work. His whole life work has been studying the Bible. And so now he's able at his senior years to provide all this wealth of teaching that he's learned over the years. Now you think about that, a thousand messages of a very capable Bible teacher. And as he makes that available to us online, we can all benefit from that. We can all learn from that. So if you start when you're young studying the Bible and starting to minister to others, then over time you will amass a lot of teaching that is valuable and helpful to another generation. So let's all think about how to study the Bible and be diligent and to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We really want to be careful in our handling of the word of God. It's not something we should mishandle or there's great judgment that awaits us. As James has said in his epistle, chapter 3, be not many masters or teachers knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So we, we do handle the word of God do it carefully. We don't presume to be more than we are, but we're anxious and happy and joyful to share what we can with others as the Lord equips us. Now, just as we continue on, um, one of the other lessons I was assigned to share was something called uh, Don't Be Gullible. Don't Be Gullible. And as I thought about this, I read through the lesson. Uh, it got me thinking on a certain track, and I'll share that with you as we think of this lesson dangers we run into as believers because sometimes we're naive, we're gullible. So for this one, I want to read from Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 to 17. There it reads this. See then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It's very important as Christians that we apply ourselves to wisdom. Here the exhortation is not to be unwise, and so it's possible for Christians to act unwisely, and that is to lack discernment because we haven't been careful to study the Word of God. We haven't been careful in applying the Word of God in our lives. And today in the church, there is widespread error. There is so much confusion and error, and uh, it surprises me sometimes how Christians can be so gullible and fall into these traps of these false teachers because I suppose we haven't taken time to equip ourselves in the Word of God. We haven't been careful to build up a, an ability to discern what is truly from God and what is from man. And so um, ask yourself this important question as we talk about Christians and their gullibility. Am I following something because everybody else is following it? I follow the crowd? Or am I following it because the Bible teaches it? It's a very important question to ask. We're all to be Bereans and ask ourselves, is this what the scripture says? Is this what the scripture teaches? I'll give you a couple of examples where I think uh, there's been widespread um, practice that is not biblical. It is not in the Bible. Um, maybe it seems to be in the Bible. We assume it's in the Bible because it's what everybody's doing, and so we just fall into it and say, well, that's what everybody's doing. It must be biblical. But in fact, when we test it against Scripture, we realize, you know, this actually isn't biblical. What everybody's doing isn't biblical. Take, for instance, something like, well, I'm almost afraid to say it, but Sunday school. Now, I'm not saying it's not biblical. Don't get me wrong now. I'm only pointing out that there's no basis in Scripture for Sunday school. There's nothing there that says we should have Sunday school. Now, is it wrong? No, it, it, it fits perfectly well with the idea of training and teaching children the Word of God. I don't oppose Sunday school. I don't think it's wrong. I'm just pointing out that while we all have Sunday school classes in every church across the country, it isn't something we're actually told to do. It's not something that's in the Bible that we're supposed to have these classes for children. In fact, the emphasis in Scripture is parents are to teach their children. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The, the, the main responsibility 
for teaching children falls upon the parents. That's biblically. That's biblical. And that's in the home is the biblical training ground for children. That's important for all of us to understand. Anyway, that, that wasn't one issue I was going to pick on necessarily. I'm just only trying to point out that there are things that we would assume must be in the Bible because it's so broadly practiced. So let's look at a couple of these. We don't want to be like the world and follow the world's wisdom and follow the crowd. We just think, well, that's what everybody else is doing, so we'll do it. We want to ask ourselves, what does God teach in his word, and how do I follow that? How do I do that? And so the first one I would talk about is the pastor of the church. The pastor of the church. Now, just about every evangelical church around the world has somebody they call the pastor of the church. It's become the most widespread sort of um, practice of leadership structure in local churches is to have the pastor. You might have other associate pastors or elders, deacons, whatever they might have, but they have somebody who they call the pastor. And it's sort of understood among everybody in evangelical circles that this is the man who's been called of God to lead that particular congregation. So that pastor would basically pre preach all the sermons pretty much and, uh, and uh, kind of rule over the church and call the shots and tell everybody this is how we're doing things, this is how we're running ministry. And everybody respects that and says, yes, well, he's the man of God. He's our pastor. He's the one God has put into that position. But is that biblical? Is that biblical? In fact, when we put that against uh, the New Testament teaching, what we find is that there is no pastor in the New Testament. The New Testament does not envision a single man overseeing a local church. When we read through the New Testament, we'll find the word pastor occurs only once in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 4. And it refers to pastors, or it refers actually to apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. It names all these various people or, or ministries that are given to the church to equip the church for the work of the ministry. But when it mentions pastors there, the word actually is unfortunate it's translated as the word pastor because of the abuse that we've found um, over these last centuries with people assuming this title called pastor. The word that is used there in Ephesians 4 is actually a word that should be translated shepherd or shepherds because every other place in the New Testament, the, um, uh, the um, translators of the Bible have chosen to use the word shepherd because that best conveys what the original language wants to share with us. So the word is shepherds. And, and notice the word is in plural too. It's plural. In every place you read about shepherds or elders or overseers, bishops, presbyters, there's all kinds of different words that are used. And I think there's four different Greek words that refer to the same person, and that is the elder of the church. And the elder of the church is always plural. They, Peter refers to the elders which are among you, I exhort. And um, every place where there is mention of these men who oversee and feed and shepherd the flock of God, it's always in the plural. So if we study our New Testament, what we'll discover is that the Bible teaches there are a group of men who are mature in Christ, who are given to a role of caring for God's people, shepherding them, feeding them the word of God helping them. Um, but we don't see this person who is residing above the church, lording it over God's heritage, as Peter warns the elders not to do, not lording it over God's heritage. But that's what's happened. And people become, we've created this position of somebody who's basically the head spiritual guy of the church, and we all cater to him. And is that, is that bad? Is that wrong? One time I questioned, well, what's so wrong about that? If it, you know, people are getting fed the word of God, it's good, you know? But in fact, it is wrong. And the reason it's wrong is this. Because when you have one man you appoint to be the head of that local church, everybody looks to that person for their spiritual guidance. But what if that person goes wrong? What if they're off in their doctrine? Then the whole church is led astray because they're sort of dependent on this one individual. 
But if you have a plurality, it adds balance. It adds uh, checks and balances to help the leadership make sure they stay on track doctrinally. In God's wisdom, he designed his church in such a way that it wouldn't be a one-man show. It wouldn't be one man assuming this leadership. There is one man who is head over the church, and that's Jesus himself. Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, he is the head of the church. He is the one that governs and guides. And if we live according to what the Bible teaches, we will follow his leadership, and we'll have men who are under shepherds. They are under Christ, and they're looking to him for their guidance and their leading and teaching for the uh, assembly to which they are accountable. So that's an important thing. So we shouldn't be on this subject of gullibility. Why is it that so many Christians have fallen into this trap? Well, I would just say it's church culture. It's what we've adopted. Everybody does it, so we go along with it. And that often happens. So let's stop and ask ourselves a question. Is this thing I'm doing for the church, with the church, in the church. Is it biblical? Is it actually in the Bible? And we each need to test everything against the Word of God and ask ourselves that important question so that we don't become gullible and we just follow the crowd and do what everybody else is doing. So let's look at another important um, aspect where I think a lot of Christians might be making errors or compromise uh, because they're not handling the Word of God carefully. And that's the issue to do with women's role in the church, women's role in the church. You know, uh, I come from a background where it's understood that women remain silent in the church, that they wear a head covering in the gatherings of the church, that they don't assume roles of leadership, either publicly in prayer or in teaching of the Word of God, not heading up ministries for the church. God has given men the role of spiritual leadership in this church. Now, women have their roles. It doesn't mean that they're ignorant or less spiritual. They're sisters in Christ. They're on equal redemptive ground, and they have great spiritual value. But their role in the church is not to assume leadership and to teach the Word of God. Their role is to, uh, mostly, their role is in the domestic sphere, in the home, to look after the home, be keepers of the home, raise their children love their husbands, and to look after a godly home is a great value in the sight of God. And their role is to be submissive and learning and to support their husbands and their, their, their men who are teaching and leading. This is God's design. We may not like it. It may not fit with our culture. It may not be popular at all. But the question is, is it biblical? Is it what the Bible teaches? Well, it, the Bible teaches us whether we like it, whether it fits our culture or not, we should follow the Bible teaches. Now in this one, it may not always be um, that people don't necessarily understand the Bible, but they try to compromise to fit with what culture is saying. This is what I notice quite often with this particular issue, which is delicate and difficult in some cases to deal with um, because there is a tendency for people to reject this. They think it's oppressive to women. They don't think it's proper, but it's what God says. And whether we like it or whether we think it's oppressive, or not, our opinion doesn't matter. What matters is what God says. And so we have to follow it very carefully. And we can't presume to say, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but I think I'd like to do it this way because, you know, less people will be offended, and we won't drive people away from the church, and, well, that's kind of old, and, you know, they did it that way. So I hear this argument sometimes, well, that's how it used to be, that's how they used to do it, but we, you know, we live in a different era, a different time. Look, the Bible is the standard for God's people throughout all generations, and if you want to use a cultural argument, then you could throw out the Lord's Supper, you can throw out the Gospel, you can just, you can get rid of anything you don't like that's unpopular. Is that where we are? Is that what we're going to do? Well, I'm certainly not. I hope you're not going to treat the Bible, sort of pick and choose what you want. Uh, so let's not be gullible in how we handle the Word of God. There are many things we could mention on this topic of being gullible as Christians. Uh, for instance, what about worship teams? You know, this is something that's been a modern trend last 30 or 40 years, 
where we put a group of people in front, basically a band, and they play, and it's almost like entertainment. Is that biblical? Is that biblical? Just ask them, is that biblical? Is that what we should be doing? And it's a good question to ask. I mean, Christians sing, and singing is part of our life, it's part of our worship, and, and we should sing. But have we made mistakes and lacked in discernment in this area where we've even allowed people who are musically talented but not necessarily very spiritual people to stand in front and lead the congregation in what we call worship? Which, uh, yeah, music can be associated with worship, but sometimes we make some mistakes in understanding what true worship is when we hear drums banging and people making, you know, it just, it becomes a musical thing. It's all about the music and not about the words and their meaning and their heartfelt expression through the worshiper. Um, if we have to drum up some kind of emotional response in order to pretend to worship God, I think we're really missing the mark. Anyway, I'm not going to go into that debate, but I just want to encourage us not to be gullible, to be discerning about the Word of God, and to ask questions on, on various things. Tithing is another issue. Tithing is an Old Testament practice, not a New Testament practice. And yet so many Christians refer to tithing as though that's what they're supposed to do. Now, if you want to give a tenth, that's what tithing means. I don't have any objection. That's fine. You give a tenth. But it's not a law like the Old Testament Jew was. And in the, in the New Testament, we're told that everyone should lay in store as the Lord has prospered them. So according to your prosperity, you're supposed to give. Not a percentage like a tenth. You're just to give according to your prosperity, your faith, what you determine. Be a cheerful giver and give to the Lord. So there's different principles there at work important to understand that. Also, another uh, topic that I think we get astray on is solicitation. The churches often are found to be begging, soliciting people to give, and that is not biblical. When we study our Bibles carefully, we realize God is not a beggar. God doesn't need anybody's money or any help from anybody. He encourages us as Christians to be generous and care for one another and support the work of the Lord, and as the Spirit of God teaches us, we'll give generously, we'll do that. But solicitation to beg people to give, um, so much in Christendom is a plot to seem to steal people's money, and that just brings a shame to the gospel and diminishes uh, the church's testimony in the world. And so that's another area where Christians have fallen into the trap of being gullible. So here are just some scattered thoughts about um, gullibility. Let's not be gullible. Let's be discerning about what the Word of God says. Test everything against Scripture and determine, is this practice that we're doing truly what the Bible teaches? Apply that to anything you do as a Christian. When the church gathers to remember the Lord, say, is this what Jesus intended when he said, do this in remembrance of me? Is this what he wanted us to do? Are we doing it the way... And, and sometimes, even in the things that we do, we recognize there's nothing, there's no fault in it. Like Sunday school, I don't find any fault with it. But we can ask the question, is this determined by the Bible for us that we should do this? Or is it something we've assumed based on principles we've learned from Scripture and fits with our overall purpose? That God wants us to, you know, meet together and to fulfill certain purposes. I'll just give you an example of this to help you know what I'm talking about. Years ago, I attended in a, an assembly where they preached the gospel every Sunday night. And it, it occurred to me after some time that the people who attended the gospel meeting, by and large, were Christians. People who were born again. People who had been saved. Sometimes children were there that weren't saved. And perhaps that was the reason we were hosting those meetings, was for the sake of the children to hear the gospel. But it seemed odd to me that maybe what we were doing was preaching to those who were already saved. And why would we do that? The, the, the sinners are out there, outside the church. We need to go to them on the street corners and preach the gospel there. And that sort of helped me in my own uh, to determine that I should take the gospel out to other people outside of the church. And, um, you know, maybe we excuse ourselves in our responsibility to share the gospel when we have some kind of gospel ministry in the church but we're just preaching to those who are saved, and that kind of misses the mark. This is where I think sometimes as Christians we demonstrate some gullibility. 
that maybe we're not very careful or discerning on how to apply ourselves to the Word of God and to test things against the Word of God and ask the question, are what we're doing, what we're doing, is it biblical? Am I fulfilling the purpose for which God has written this? And to think about that carefully and so we don't end up spinning our wheels and spending a lot of wasted time and energy on things that really are not a spiritual value and not what God intended. May the Lord help us and guide us and direct us into all truth and to a godly practice and we won't be Christians who are found to be gullible and naive and uh, falling into all kinds of error and traps and fitting into the world rather than fitting into the Bible and what God has said. Let us be people of the book, people who understand the mind of God, the will of God, and are determined even in the face of it being unpopular and uh, going against our culture, but we stand on our convictions on the Word of God. The Lord bless you as you Think on these things and consider them.